Fitness trainer and expert Chris Ryan, also on NBC Strong, joins me here at Velocity Sports Performance uh, here in Midtown Manhattan. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's talk about your background. Division one athlete, you're a track and field star, uh, University of Florida. Tell me about your athletic background. I think star might be stretching a little bit <laughs> at University of Florida. Okay. I wanted to be, you know, right. uh, you know, I was always active as a kid. Uh, my parents had us, my brother and I, into sports from an early age. We had the boxing bag in the basement, little weight sets and everything else, doing pull-ups, all that stuff, just to wear us out, probably so we wouldn't drive our parents nuts. But, uh, you know, I showed some promise in track after, you know, I, I played basketball and soccer and stuff growing up. When I was in early in high school, uh, I started showing promise in the middle distance races, the 800, the 400, and the mile a little bit. Concentrated more on the 800. Uh, I was state runner up then, and as I progressed later in, into my track career in high school, and eventually I got to the University of Florida on a scholarship, partial scholarship, because they don't give away a ton of scholarships for uh, NCAA sports due to uh, Title IX um, for men. But it's one of those things that it was it was absolutely great experience I had at University of Florida. It was, you know, world-class coaches at Olympians on my team, contracts at Nike and Oakley. It was like being a professional athlete wow. without getting paid, you know. Um, but it was one of those things that I wanted to be an NCAA champion. I wanted to be, you know, an Olympian, and that's what I always saw myself doing. I got there, and my body just said, uh-oh, you know, we're not going to cooperate with this heavy training schedule. You know, you, you still are, an at, you know, an athlete, but you're still a student, too, at the same time. So you're sitting there, you know, I was academic freshman of the year at the time too so I was you know going heavy schedule with the studies and all that and then getting up at 5 30 in the morning and working out in the weight room and then going to class all day and then sweating out on the track for three hours during the workouts and rehab and all that stuff and then going to study hall in the evening I mean it was like you know 16 hours 17 hours a day so it was uh it was tough you know my body after my sophomore year I had a bad injury major hamstring tear but I learned a lot about myself, you know, that just because you went down one road and you thought you were going to go down this road, but if you give it your all, you're still successful with it. You know, it just, I won't ever have that Olympic gold medal, unfortunately. Maybe my son will. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, one on the way, by the way. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, so after college, what, it, what was it? Your body was breaking down a little bit? Yeah, it was just, it was, you know, overtraining. Um, and that's what makes me such a great trainer in understanding the human body now. And I work with people that ha are very, you know, here in New York, I have a lot of clients that are, you know, all Ivy Leaguers, more three quarters of my clients went to Ivy League schools. A few of them went to like Harvard twice, you know, for different degrees. Twice. I mean, like, I have like, Once isn't yeah, enough. I mean, I have a special a specialty in the Ivy League, you know, training okay. for, uh, you know, very high level uh, business executives here in the city. Um, and it's one of those things that I see that just because that, you know, the way the human body is, that they, if they sit a lot, it's about reaching that full potential for themselves. It's about working out the body. And I had a major hamstring tear because I had an undeveloped posterior chain so one of the things I do a lot with my clients that sit a lot is work on the posterior chain working on the hamstrings the glutes the hips the lower back all that stuff that helps support our frame much more than just the aesthetically pleasing muscles if you will of the front side where everyone wants to have like you know strong core six on the pack, front yeah, the six yeah. pack and the big biceps and the deltoids for the guys and you know the the trim little six pack for the girls and stuff like that and then you know the human body is you can't really target train per se right. you know you can no work one can look like me <laughs> <laughs> you can you can target train up to a point but right. like for the most functionality you want to think about working your body in full functional range of movement as much as possible rather than oh i'm just going to target my abs for today or whatever you know right so you mentioned two things one being overworking out and mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't going to bring this up, but as an example, uh, David Wright, who's the third baseman yes. of the Mets, for me, because I've been around the Mets, I'm a big Mets fan, I've seen that mm -hmm. Wright um, kind of, he was such a workout fiend, he was a gym rat. I mean, he was in the gym, I remember taking a tour of City Field, and they said, the security guard said, we saw him here on Christmas morning working out. Yeah. So when you, you hear about that, and obviously his forearms are so big, and yeah. you know, probably hurt his back by working out so much, yeah. he's got the spinal stenosis, and now a neck injury. Yeah. Um, what, what do you say to those types who don't want to leave the gym, that they're in the gym all day? It's, you know, it's, it's just like it's very similar to Tiger Woods, right? He got right. crazy working out, you know? And a golf ball and a baseball weigh a few ounces, right? How strong do you technically have to be to where it just becomes, you know, more of a lifestyle choice rather than not? Now, a professional athlete, those guys, David Wright and Tiger Woods, are amazing athletes, yeah. you know. Um, but if you're training like uh, an elite CrossFitter or as you're a baseball player, I think you probably got to concentrate a little bit more on baseball. I think as David Wright's doing now, and he's understanding. Like I read about his training in Sports Illustrated a few months ago. They had a great article on him, and it was or it was a Men's Journal, one of those magazines. But it was like such a great article on his regime now and how he's still working out hard 
but he's working out with a little bit more modifications, a little bit more of working on the mobility, working on, you know, I always like to say I like to see symmetry in people, especially with baseball players or any sort of throwing motion, that sort of a thing. You tend to be a little bit more concentrated on one side, whatever your dominant side is. So even if you're, you know, if you're a jumper, you're going off one foot all the time, you tend to not have symmetry in your body. So you have to work all that symmetry. If you're, you know, constantly throwing, you got to work on your, you know, your other ancillary muscles on top of that too. So it's not just about working on what you think you need to work on. It's working on everything else besides that. And so, you know, as injuries happen, athletes understand, oh, okay, it's not just about working an injury. It's working all those parts around that injury. So would you recommend for someone, whether it be, you know, a top athlete or not, to do the type of conditioning that David Wright does before a game to get ready? I mean, he spends about three hours pregame just yeah. to loosen up his body. Do you recommend that type of stretching for people? It Maybe not to that extent. Yeah, but. you know, it depends. I, I mean, I'm sure David Wright's got the, the best professionals in the industry for that know his body that have probably worked with him for years. And it's it's at that point, and, and he's the point zero zero one percent of the elite. You know, at that point, it's such a, it's like a f super fine classic Italian sports car. You know, there's going to be a certain mechanic that knows how to deal with that versus a mechanic that just knows how to deal with like a high end Chevy Corvette that's a 2016 model, right? Yeah. So you have to figure out like what is the best realm for you at that that point but for overall general fitness for the other 99% of the people out there it's about taking your body through a full range of motion as much as you can opening up your ball and socket joints your hips and your shoulders like really loosening those up don't just do all pressing motion you got to do pulls and you got to move the shoulders in different realms you got to move the hips just because if you walk that's good cardio base you know if you're like walking a few miles a day for the average person right, right. America would be much more fit society if it's like here in Manhattan where the average person walks a couple miles a day just to and from the subways or in their office buildings. Also whatever. good to avoid the McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it is, it's one of those things that you gotta figure out your goals for like where you're at in your life. But I, I think that you, you never want it to inhibit your lifestyle, you know, mm -hmm. like, I'm thir like I said before, I'm 36 years old. I have a wife, a son. I have a very busy schedule. I have another baby on the way. You know, it's just, it's one of those things that I don't train as hard as I used to when I was in my 20s, right? I just can't, I don't have the time. Now, am I still fit? Yeah, but I've taken, you know, the mental block of saying, okay, take that out there. You're, this is a different portion of your life now. You're gonna be extremely fit, but you're gonna just do things a little bit more modified. You're not gonna be able to like practice certain moves as much, like certain lifts, I'm not gonna be able to, practice lifts on the platform of like doing snatch and clean and jerk all the time and stuff like that. Like, you know, maybe I would if I could, but you know, now it's about, I have a half hour between clients or 45 minutes between this, that, and the other thing, you know? And it's just between, you know, going to see my son for a little bit and read him a bedtime story before I see my evening clients or give him a bath or whatever, give my wife a kiss and eat dinner with her. All those things are much more important to me than what my back squat is. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's all lifestyle Total. for you. Total. Now, the other thing you mentioned, we'll go back to that. I want to talk about how you train your clients, but mm -hmm. the other thing you mentioned was sitting down. Yeah. Um, a lot of bit, and you work with a clientele that's mostly you know business professionals. Yes. And uh, they're sitting down in an office somewhere in Manhattan all yeah. day. You know they're on the phone. They don't move much. There were some studies that came out a few months ago, I believe it was, saying that you know if you sit down a lot, um, you actually you know are gaining weight just by the minute totally. and losing your mobility, and yeah. you, you could get arthritis uh, very you know it could come on at yeah. a young age. So tell me about what you do with your business clients. That I mean they're sitting down, they're not mobile all day. Yeah. So what type of workout is good for them? Cer certain things that even they can do at their office that I advise and that several clients have actually taken me up on. Um, I like to have a yoga block sometimes in between their knees so that uh -huh. they can bounce their core a little bit more. And it's something that's so light, but if you're doing it while you're on a conference call for 45 minutes, your core is a little bit more engaged than normal, right? So it's just those slight little modifications that happen. Sitting on like a physio ball, you know, like the big plastic balls, mm -hmm. instead of rather sitting in a chair. Like we could be doing the interview right now. We could be on yoga balls. We could be on the balls, you know, <laughs> instead of sitting on these like nice relaxing chairs. I know chairs, someone right? at, uh, at Fox News where I work, Judge uh, Janine Pirro, yeah. she sits on a yoga ball yeah. in, her, in front of her desk. Totally, and I think standing's great. Um, I think standing all day though tends to, depending on who you are, it can lock up a lot if you're not moving around while you're standing. But I think your voice projects more. So if you you're on a conference call, it'd be very authoritarian. I can't talk on the phone and sit down. Yeah, I have to yeah, be up. like you know have the speakerphone out there and just stand up, walk around. Be you know have meetings walking. You know here in Manhattan, especially up here in Midtown where we're at, get out to the park. Like go for a walk and like get out of the office a little bit. You know, right. I was talking to you a little bit off camera earlier about the need to work out outside. We're in 
New York, for God's sakes. We have, you know, yep. terrible winters. You know, this spring wasn't too hot either. And so it's just like, you know, I made it a goal for myself as well as my clients to get out to the park more this year and just getting out there and smelling the cut grass, getting a little grass stains and tree sap on you every once in a while. You know, as long as you can shower afterward, you're good to go. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, and that's that's tough sometimes. Not, <laughs> not every place is a yeah, shower. Yeah, exactly. Come in, you're the stinky one in the coffin truck. <laughs> but, all right, so working out of Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, you have, it's such a beautiful day today. It's a beautiful yeah. all week. Uh, going outside, uh, is that better for the brain too? I mean, do you have to work out to ensure that um, not only your body is getting the workout, mm -hmm. but your brain as well? Is totally. that a challenge? Totally. I mean, that's, you know, back to the show, Strong, you know, it was about finding the best self for yourself, right? It was about finding the best self for these 10 women that were on the show with us, and that's what attracted me so much for this show. It was, you know, for me, it's about not only physically, not only mentally, but also spiritually. And I grew up on 80 acres in Michigan, and I love nature. And I think at the heart of hearts, most humans do. You know that we truly do love nature. As, many, as much as you love the city and you love the amazing buildings and museums and the multicultural aspect that we have here in New York and what makes the city the best city in the world, it's still that, you know, being able to be close to the park and like doing stuff in, inside the park and just, you know, doing push-ups against a tree or like just, you know, being out there. It's, it's an amazing park and I love, you know, Central, Central Park is, speaks to me on so many levels. It makes you feel happy being totally. outside. So, do you notice that with your business clients who, especially in the winter, you know, they're in their office and may feel gloomy because it's, you know, <laughs> dark when they get to the office, dark when they leave the office. Yeah. So, when they finally get to a, you know, a nice spring and summer in New York, is it just mentally it's more refreshing and they can go out for a walk and actually do physical activity outside. Do you think that's the best way to go for people? Totally, totally. You know, it, it's the four season rule too. You know, do what you can within the seasons. It's just kind of like eat wherever, you, you know, eat within 50 miles of wherever you live. Like yeah. eat the foods from 50 miles wherever you live. You know, that helps with your nutritional aspect, right? Same thing with, you know, your fitness. Like kind of work with whatever nature gives you in and around where you're at. So if it's cold, you know, stay inside a little bit more and hit it hard in here, but try to still keep it functional and high intensity and stuff like that. But if it's nice, get outside, you know, because it's much about fitness is about getting healthy up here as it is, you know, physically throughout your whole body. And uh, to me, you know, I, I see people do it all the time. I mean, I do corporate fitness challenges with clients and their firms sometimes too. Like the other week, last week, I did one with my client. He's a man managing partner of a private equity company. And, him and his 10 employees came out there and we did this fun little corporate boot camp fitness challenge stuff. And you know, you see people out of their suits, you know, in some of these people, even though they've worked together for years, have never seen somebody like out of their new collared shirt, you know, and dress pants or a suit coat or whatever. And to see them just having fun as like school age kids again, you know, and you see the twinkle in their eye and they're smiling and they're sweaty and they might go out and have a celebratory beer or whatever afterward. And, but the camaraderie that you see, it's really awesome, you know? And I always like to have a little bit of a travel focus when I do those corporate fitness challenges with the businesses in the area. It's just like, because everyone's traveling, you know, everyone's busy. So I always like tell them like hotel room workouts and things to do and answer a little bit of Q&A for them so that they understand, you know, what it takes to stay fit. It's not about just being big, ripped and strong like right. so many people think. It's about just being the best version of yourself and like, okay, I'm 35 now, but I'm gonna be 45 and I'm gonna be 55 and I wanna still be fit when I'm 55, 65, that sort of thing. What kind of, now for just an average person who mm -hmm. just wants to be fit, just wants to be healthy, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, hypertension is the leading cause of death totally. in this country. So they just wanna be fit, they don't wanna, you know, have the big belly, they wanna, you know, they just wanna be fit so that they could be there for their family when they're older. Mm -hmm. What do you tell them? I mean, they may be concerned. They may have knee problems, joint pain. Uh, do you suggest that they run outside on concrete? You do know, you, you know, no. what's the type of? Definitely not concrete. Yeah. I'm a huge proponent. Um, I work with several overweight uh, clients. Um, I mean, everyone's always trying to lose weight, but right. obese clients, that people that are, are looking to lose that massive amount of weight, right? And for them, it's always working out on very soft surfaces at first, if not water. I love water. I love pool running. Pool running is something that's been in my blood since I was like 10. My dad built a pool in our house after reading this newsletter in the Soviet Union about how to alleviate stress on your joints because this is like 1989, right before the fall of the Soviet Union. And all the good, you know, best strength and conditioning coaches at the time were in the Soviet Union because they invested in military and athletics. <laughs> and that's obviously not two things that you want to invest your, your whole livelihood into. It's like Drago. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, <Rocky> right? <laughs> so, like, you know, my dad read this thing and, and, and he was like, he told my mom, you know, maybe this is why they're divorced. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it's like one of the reasons, you know, he, um, 
built a pool in the back of our house, like in a former playroom that my brother and I had as kids. It was a seven foot deep by seven foot wide by seven foot long pool. And it was strictly for pool running because Michigan had ter worse winters than New York. You know, it's like upstate New York style, not Manhattan, you know, the, the boroughs right. and stuff like that. So you get, you know, tons of snow, you get tons of ice, and it goes well into late April. And uh, so it was one of those things to figure out ways to cross train rather than running outside, dealing with upper respiratory infections. And, you know, stepping up the mileage, you want to be careful of running on the pavement as well. So, like, people that are, are majorly, you know, that are looking to lose weight or just have other issues. For me, I don't run on pavement a lick whatsoever. I mean, I might run on 10 feet of it to cross the street or whatever. Right. But I, like, you know, in the park, I'll run on the bridle trail, you know, where the packed dirt is where all the horses go. I'll run around the reservoir, things like that. I'll only run on Mondo tracks. Um, I only run on treadmills if I need to, um, because it's just pavement super hard, cement super hard, and you're and treadmills. Some people are don't like to run on treadmills because it's hard and it's totally. hard on the knees and the ankles too. And totally, yeah. It's it, it it puts a lot of stress on you. Running does in general, and this is from a runner. Like, yeah. This is my arguably, and I think running is by far the best exercise you could ever do. Right, but there's ways to go about it now in 2016 that like people are like, I don't need to go out and pound the pavement, you know. It's also about running economy. It's learning how to run properly rather than just run. There's so many people that are out there that are heel strikers that are putting a ton of pressure on their joints and hips rather than, you know, putting pressure on the ball of their foot like we're naturally supposed to run, you know? Now, what about weight training? I mean, when people say, I want to get ripped, I mean, you have someone <laughs> like my age, right? Now, I'm pretty ripped. But you have someone who wants to get, you know, strong and uh, their biceps and that whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, they're in their 20s and that's yeah. what they care about. Do you say, well, you should really focus on cardio as well because cardio is good for your heart and all that. Which, what do you tell them as far as the balance? Because some people say, I've heard people tell me, well, you know, I do more weight training. I don't really do cardio because you lose muscle by doing cardio. Well, here's the thing. Everyone's going to be different, okay? I would say train for your body type depending on what goals you have. You know, take a woman versus a man or a man versus a woman. Look at, you know, there's three major body types out there, an ectomorph, an endomorph, and a mesomorph. You know, an ect picture a football game, okay? So an ectomorph is going to be much more of like your receiver that sort of player it's gonna be my my size right, right. Um, I'm actually naturally very skinny if I don't touch a heavy weight I lose weight very quickly mm. which is sounds great but growing up I was six foot tall 140 pounds in college yeah so like you know you're like the twig you know and pencil chest Absolutely. and all yeah. that you oh, know I hear you. so it's just like it's kind of like the reverse you know and then you have your 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 mesomorph who's kind of like the middle road like the strong safety the the middle linebacker super athletic they can put on a you know a good amount of muscle they're always a natural athlete but as life goes on and they don't work out as much they can put on you know a little bit more punch in the belly if you're a guy a little bit more punch in the in the uh, buttocks area if you're a woman um, and then you have your endomorph where the hips are a little bit wider than the shoulders more of a pear-shaped body at times now it's not to say that you can't be ripped that way or like get big and strong but that's gonna be much more of like your lineman style body right so you got to think about like and that's a like a grandiose way of saying there's three body types there's many right. more body types out there but it's trained in accordance to what you are like and it like an ectomorph right if you're six foot tall and 140 pounds you want to put on muscle if you're out there pounding the pavement running marathons you're not gonna put on muscle, I'm sorry, yeah. you know? There's, for that type of person, I would say we have to do the big, heavy compound lifts. You know, for the for the, the middle road like person, it really depends on where they're at. I would always say like, let's do the big lifts, the squat, the deadlift, you know, um, and the variations within those lifts, the presses, you know, the bench press, the standing military press. I love pull-ups, I love rowing, you know, rowing on the machine or row, the bent over rows, things like that. But the big barbell lifts for anyone that's looking to put on size and muscle. And then you, of course, can, you know, do the, the uh, physique style workouts in between with the dumbbells and the pulley systems and all that. But as long as things are functional, I'm not uh, I'm not a person that like sits there and does a ton of bicep curls. I'm much more about the person that would love to do a ton of pull-ups to get bigger biceps, right? If that's your goal, but I'd rather see you go through that full range of motion than do weighted pull-ups. Make them a little harder. But I love like the old school major lifts because the body was designed thousands of years ago and the body moves in a certain way. So even with technology, <laughs> yeah. and everything at your own, you know, at your disposal yeah. in this great gym, totally. you say old fashioned is the way to go. Yeah, it, it, picking up heavy things, moving heavy things, moving them fast, moving your own body fast. I mean, heck, it doesn't even matter. You, you, you know, it doesn't matter if you weigh 200 pounds, 100 pounds, or 300 pounds. If you learn how to move your body a little bit better and more economically, more efficiently, you're gonna be a better athlete. Right. You know, back to David Wright, what we were talking about earlier, a lot of his training now is back to learning how to move his body a little bit more efficiently. He's not necessarily doing crazy heavy weight workouts like he used to, no, I don't right? think he can, yeah, and I he think it's can. range of motion exactly. now. Exactly, right? and now it's like, okay, here's where he's at now. 
where can he be and still progress the way he needs to as a ball player, right? To make sure that he has that longevity in his career that you want for him, I want for him, and every other Mets fan out there wants for him, you know? Or even the people that are fans of Tiger Woods, like, what can Tiger Woods do to get back in golf? You know, he's been trying it. You know, he's, he's done his swing over. He's, he's doing all this different back surgeries. Right. And he's done a ton of different workout regimes. And that's where about, people start to think it's mental, too. Totally, yeah. You, you know, at a certain point with certain athletes, it probably is. Maybe with Tiger, it could be. But, like, with, with other athletes like David Wright, I don't think it's mental. It's physical with him. Yeah. You know, he's an amazing athlete, amazing ball player. And wish the, you know wish him luck as much as he can in the future. But with that said, it's like you want to learn from those mistakes. Just like I learned from my hamstring tear, and I learned that my posterior chain was far undeveloped compared to my anterior and my front side and I was like why are the sprinters looking different like when you look at their body types you look at a sprinter and you look at me as a middle distance runner who's arguably just a few seconds slower than them in any of the you know the sprint races and like the 100 200 or whatever um, and it was like okay but where are the development issues there and I saw like you know my hamstrings were nowhere near their size and you know my quads were huge but my hamstrings were nothing you know and their quad they seem to have much more symmetry in their bodies than mine and I figured that out too late, you know, for myself, but when I look at my clients and none of them are going to be Olympians in their, this lifetime, you know, or, you know, NBA players or NFL players, but it's about looking at them and taking into that context of saying, okay, how great can they be at 35, at 55, at 75, you know? Um, one of my goals always for my female clients, especially, and male clients too, but best, especially the female clients is because it happens more often than not, you're traveling on an airplane and you see the woman come in with a rollerboard and then she might be 35 years old and then she needs help to put it up in the upper compartment, right? right? And all that is is a simple clean and jerk. It's picking up the rollerboard to your waist, putting it up to your chest and then putting it over your head, right? Simple functional compound movement. You can't get more functionally easy than that, mm -hmm. right? Relatively, but so many people can't do it. And so I always tell my female clients because most of them are around that 35 to 45 year old age bracket here in the city is that I want them at 75 years old to be when they're vis going to visit their grandkids wherever they're at in the world to be able to pick up the rollerboard and put it overhead and little things like that really cue in it's not about like oh i want to have the tightest butt ever i want to have a sexier midsection right. you know than i did at 25 or you know after i've already had a couple kids you know odds it's more are, about if, just being yeah, healthy and fit odds are it's like owning who you are at this stage in your life try to keep where you're at as long as you can for the time you go on you know, it's about investing in your body the same way that you invest in your 401ks. Consistency matters. Like, you pay whatever it is into your retirement fund every year, and that's the way it is since you're in your 20s, right? So the same thing with your fitness. We are athletes and growing up, everyone played kickball, everyone played soccer, you know? But eventually what happens in high school, you start to dive into other interests, things get a little bit more serious. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm not as, I'm not gonna be seven <laughs> foot tall and playing for the Knicks or whatever. Unfortunately, you know? no, I not Chris you know? I mean, for no. me, it was like, okay, I'm not gonna go to the Olympics, but that doesn't yeah. mean that I can't be an amazing, badass athlete, you know, into myself. You know, be the best version of Neil, be the best version of Chris, that sort of a thing. And, and that's where people have to understand a little bit more um, it's not about looking like the people on the magazines or looking like the people on TV. It's about looking your best, feeling your best mentally, physically, and spiritually. Now, you've been on magazines, too, <laughs> so now that he brings this up, I'll, I'll embarrass you. Now, Chris, you've been on with GQ Magazine. You've been yeah. on Rattle Them Off. I, 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 well, I, you're, I, you're a fitness model, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, it's always one of those things that, you know, at the ripe old age of 30, I got into that world. Okay. Right. Um, I had been a business person for my whole like whole adult life. I worked in, in my degrees are in econ and international relations. Wow. So um, I graduated from Michigan State after my University of Florida track days uh, parlayed themselves. Then I uh, worked in corporate finance for about seven months, eight months. Didn't, wasn't really my thing. Uh, so I went into uh, the serve pro business of fire, water, mold damage restoration work with my brother and another childhood friend of ours. And we partnered up. We built it up to four franchise territories and 20 plus employees, you know, a million and a half in sales. And we sold it at the end of 08. Uh, and I learned a ton about the world and business and everything else. But I wasn't really... I wasn't really into that world as much as I thought. You know, the next time I did a business, I wanted to be something that I truly loved, that I was passionate about. And I was like, what am I passionate about? So after we sold the business, I looked at myself and what I'd love to do, even during that time, I love working out, I love health, I love fitness, I love you know, leading people, I love sales and stuff like that. So for me, that was like, okay, can I parlay that into a career? And lo and behold, some people up here got a hold of some photos that I took for a friend who was a trainer. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. You know, at the ripe old age of 30, I decided to tackle the world of modeling. And they call me all the time. I just <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, you know, and it was, uh, you know, I do a ton of work with men's fitness. Right. You know, I've been on the cover of their magazine a couple times, which is great. I love those guys. Men's health. You know, I've been a men's journal. 
uh, GQ have been in, um, you know, to say the Cosmo, guy, quite a bit, you know, quite a bit yeah. of magazines out there. I do a lot of work with, uh, you know, the big the big players out there, the, the Adidas, the Reeboks, the Nikes, the Under Armors. Are they um, still sponsoring you now? No, I don't do sponsorships. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a business reason why you don't want to do sponsorship, per se. You know why? If they want to wrap you up for a certain amount of money, then they can. So I'm open down, to sponsorships. Yeah. <laughs> but so far, there hasn't so been... Much. So far, there hasn't been the right one to align myself with for the for my family's interests, okay. if you will. So right now, it's, you know... Well, you have a family to worry about yeah, now. Exactly. It's much totally. life. So it's just like, you know, you in this realm, I'm sure it'll happen at some point that I'll probably, you know, pour my eggs more into one basket. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, it, it's good that I'm able to market myself with all these companies, give them what they want on a smaller basis. And then, you know, we'll see what happens in the future, if you will. But I worked with Ralph Lauren. I did their, uh, you know, I did on a consulting basis with them for their, uh, their Polo Tech shirt, which oh, is the relaunch of the Polo Sport brand last year. And I did all the consulting work and it was the featured uh, athlete in their app. And it's me in their app on their, you know, on the iPhone that you're when you're doing their, your workout with the Polo Tech shirt, reading off your biometric data of your heart rate, breathing rate, all that stuff. Um, so that was really cool. Amazing to be able to be involved with a huge player in the fashion world like Ralph Lauren and then do something that you truly love to be, you know, show them how, you know, what you're capable of doing. So that was really cool and help yeah, them relaunch awesome. the Polo Sport brand because it's getting much more, you know, about being an athlete rather than the, the beautiful guy in the sailboat with his coffee, you know, coffee hair, right, right. Uh, you know, and his collar flipped up like, <laughs> you know, 1995. No, this is 2016. People right. want to see you get chalked up, get you a little dirty, get a little sweaty, that sort of thing. So it was fun. Absolutely. Was fun. I'm going to get a little sweaty in a little bit. I'm going to ask <laughs> yeah. you about what kind of work you're going to give me. But first, mm -hmm. I want to talk about the show. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first season. It's going to yeah. finish up this week. What was your, how, how would you describe your experience with Strong on NBC? My experience was amazing. I loved it. Uh, it was one of those things. I'm not a reality TV person. I'm not really a big TV person in general. Uh, I just, uh, for one, I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> you know, I, just being a new father and very busy. My, my, my mornings tend to be very early. My evenings tend to be very late. And then there's a lot of other stuff in between. So and for, you have to sleep at some yeah, point. Yeah, and then at some point, you know, you have to sleep. What you can do on five hours you of know, sleep a night is Real amazing. quick, actually, yeah. how much sleep do you recommend for for a person, you know, to, to be fit, to be healthy? You know, I would say the average person in definitely at least over seven hours, if not eight, preferably. Yeah. Um, if you can get eight, awesome. You know, I think anything more than that, I don't think most people need. Once again, everyone's going to be different. There what was, if you can't get There was one guy on the show, a good friend of mine, Benny Wiley from the Blue Team, he could sleep. He's like one of those rare breeds that can sleep like four hours a night and be perfectly fine. It's like, imagine what you could do if you only had to sleep from like midnight till 4 a.m. That's like how Donald Trump is. I mean, <laughs> yeah, he's I tweeting till 2 a.m. I know. And he gets like, I wish I could do that. Shows. You know, my son's actually forcing me to find that proper life bounce around that five, six hour range. So. <laughs> is it is it okay though if you only sleep four or five hours? It depends. I mean, for me personally, like I can see, I could do it for one day, pound an extra cup of coffee or whatever. Uh, and just kind of get through it, you know, that's just what you yeah. do in your mid-30s as a father and a husband and you're trying out there to provide for your family and you have clients and obligations. But it's not going to physically kill you, is it? <laughs> There's a lot more other things out there that will physically kill you. I think it's going to be decreased performance in whatever you're doing, you know, like you have to show up to your 6 a.m. clients bright and chipper because they're paying you great money. And this is like a lot of times they're a big part of their day before they go off, you know, and you got to get that, you know, that life bounce for them of like, okay, let's hit it. And immediately, like when I walk into the gym, it's just however tired you are. I mean, I've trained clients coming off a of red eye back from LA before when I've come in here at six and I'm just like, let's roll, you know, like it just is what it is. You just do it. You got through it. Let me ask you this. Cause I know people who are just, you know, an average person who have a, you know, personal training. Or mm -hmm. not that they spend that much money on it, but I think that the concept, the maybe it's a misconception, but uh, the conception is that you know if I hire a personal trainer, it costs a lot of money. I don't have that money to dispose of yeah. right now. Uh, what? And I'm not going to ask you how much you charge because yeah. it's you know that you probably yeah. wouldn't tell me anyway. Yeah. But you know what would. Uh, what, is that a misconception uh, that you're charging a lot for personal training? No, I think I think what it is is that it's like any service business, you get what you pay for. Um, you know, I, I think I have, you know, a dozen clients that would gladly pay what I charge and then some more, you know, because they get what they pay for. You know, it comes from being a, a business owner from before. I think there's, you know, a lot of trainers out there that could probably benefit from learning how to run a service business a little bit better because that's ultimately what you are is a service provider, right? So it's not so much about learning how to squat better. You know, there's tons of amazing trainers out there that don't make a good amount of living either because they don't know how to market themselves. They don't know how to, 
you know, they're scared to put, push their rates. I've known trainers out there that literally double their rates overnight because they're like, I have too many clients, I don't have a life. And all their clients stayed with them. They're like, shit, I didn't solve that problem, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's funny because like, they were ultimately providing a great service, they were just undervaluing themselves. So just like any service business, figure out what the market is, figure out where you're at. Obviously, we're in Manhattan here. The clientele that I deal with and the, the types of issues that I deal with, they demand a certain type of trainer and a certain fee. There's other trainers out there that might be in middle America that you can't charge what you charge in Manhattan. The cost sure. of living isn't there. So you charge according Everything's to Everything's relative market. to yeah, there's, geography. Yeah, there's a ton of relativity to it. Um, and also understand who your client focus is, you know? I mean, there's trainers out there that solely look at working with professional athletes. They're gone nine months a year, right? You might only be working with them two or three months a year in their off season because they need to take a month off when they're done. And so you're hitting it hard with them. So you're gonna have to like space out your own business accordingly for that. It sounds great to train an A-list celebrity too, but they are the same way as a professional athlete. They are with you for a couple months while they're getting ready for a show or a movie, but then they're off in Timbuktu shooting that movie for eight, nine months. Right. So where is your other business gonna come from, you know? So for me, I found here in Manhattan that I love the business executives, the people that are just the grinders that are out there, they're, 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 they're the type A's, they, they, they schedule you at 6 a.m., they schedule at 8 a.m., 9 a.m., whatever it is, and they're there all the time. They're there to hit it, they know what they need to do, and arguably it's one of the better parts of their day that focuses them on, on their careers and their business and their families and everything else they have in their life. That's, you just focus that's, on that. that's more important, but this is the only hour of the day that they have to focus on themselves. And sometimes, you know, a few days a week, it might only be three hours a week that they devote to themselves. You know, I always say work on yourself first, because then you're gonna make everyone else in your company, your family, you're gonna be a better spouse, you're gonna be a better husband or wife, you're gonna be a better, you know, father or mother to your kids. And it's funny, I mean, clients tell me all the time how they're like, oh, their employees are, you know, oh, you didn't work out today with Chris or whatever, you know? <laughs> and I, I'd imagine it's, um, it's better to work out with somebody. I mean, I work out alone yeah. and I have no problem with that, but I'd imagine it's almost like motivation to work totally. out Totally, you know, unfortunately for myself, I can speak for myself because I work out by myself a lot because my schedule is the least important out of everybody. So it's, it's like, right. you know, it just is what it is. So I'll fit myself in small little, 15, 20, 30 minute segments in between clients or in between like, you know, family stuff or in between, you know, other obligations I have in the business world. And it is what it is. So I'm my least important person, right? But for other people, yeah, it's just about fitting that, that finding that schedule, finding that balance, but being consistent with it. Trying to show up as much as you can to do as maximum amount of what you can for your body, getting your heart rate up, getting that sweat in, getting your shoulders and your hips open as much as possible. Working th other things like balance and mobility control as well, learning how your body moves just by itself. Especially as you age, you wanna learn how the body moves. You know, my grandpa had a broken hip and then he ultimately died of an infection in the hospital, you know, from, you know, loss of bounce control. How many elderly Happens folks that you, you see, you know, slipped or whatever, just due to the fact of the matter that they don't know how to control their bodies as much. Um, you know, you see the some of the elderly clients in here, and they're just doing simple but functional, amazing work with the trainers there. You know, Is that a lot of work on the core? To, yeah, a lot of work on the core, but also within the feet. The feet are, which we're gonna work on with you a little bit too. Okay. Even though you're, you're a younger, fit guy per se, right, as far as the height, height body mass ratio goes. I'm very tall. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, the feet are your support system for when you're walking, right? Sure. So I, I love working with people with their feet because a lot of times that's what causes ailments in the hips, within the spine. So if you don't have like a strong glutes or whatever, you have to learn how to engage not just the core, but also your glutes because your glutes are the strongest part of your body. So even though you're a guy and you know, most guys don't care about their butt, they should a little bit more, you know, really? in okay. the way that, you know, women want to have a great looking butt too, right? And as guys, you want your woman to have a great looking I've butt. Heard, you I've know? Heard. No, but for the fact of the matter is, is that your butt, picture this, so you're walking around all these skyscrapers, right? So your butt is actually the foundation for your spine to go in. So picture all these skyscrapers out here around us here in Midtown, that you have all these sp columns all around, which are, are arguably our spinal column, right? But you have to dig down deep. You know, a hundred story building is dug down, what, 20, 30, 40 stories or something like that? You, need, you see them all the time of how deep they have to dig in because they're building that solid foundation. Same way for the support for your glutes, that your stronger your glutes are, the stronger, more upright your posture is gonna be. And that's gonna have your shoulders better, your symmetry better, stronger feet, all that stuff. All right. And you look better when you're totally. fit and happy. Yeah, and shoulders Even up. just smiling, totally, you know, makes yeah, you look better, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, you get blood flow to your cheeks, you know, all that stuff. You get the twinkle in your eye. Right. One of the things I noticed on the show is that, you know, we had 10 amazing transformations uh, for the women on the show, right? And it was basic strength and conditioning over a few months. 
you know, it was things about hitting it hard. I mean, these women, for, for the time frame that we had to deal with, we hit it arguably harder than we would have with a normal client, you know, because we only had a few months to work with them. But it was the same thing that, like, you saw the twinkle in their eye that they didn't have before. And that's back to the being the spiritual and the mental side of it, too, is that that's what fitness does for you. It increases your blood flow, and you know, that sort yeah, of a thing. It absolutely. Really, it makes your shoulders pull back. It tightens up your core. It tightens up your glutes, so you're walking around a little bit more tall and proud. Really, you really I do. I feel you know, it when uh, I work out. Now, I want to ask you about that tight workout schedule because, I mean, there have been other shows like on NBC, The Biggest yeah. Loser, and that's been coming, uh, you know, coming under some scrutiny now yeah. with uh, supplements, and there's some allegations. I know there's an article yeah. in the Post this morning, yeah. actually, um, about supplements and, and the use of that. Mm. Well, let me ask you, and I'm going to yeah. ask you an honest question here. Do you guys use supplements on the show? Yeah, I mean, EAS was a sponsor of the show, but basic protein. What was the? EAS. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, they're a big company out there. You can buy in any GNC or Abbott Laboratories. They're a sponsor on the show, and they had supplements readily available for us, but just basic everyday stuff. I mean, Giovanna, really, for my training, we just did basic, you know, holistic, organic stuff. Uh, little protein shakes here and there when we needed to after, like, when we had a tight uh, training schedule with some of the shooting schedule that we had to do. Um, and you, just like here, you know, I pound a protein shake down too. If I have, you know, if I just hit a workout and I have another client, I'm not able to eat. But like a protein a shake is simple. Yeah, exactly. There wasn't anything, there was nothing on strong that was anything that you couldn't buy. You know, right, like, any GNC. Yeah, you know, what's, like, what's scary to me is yeah. that you could have a 12 year old go into a GNC yeah. and buy anything, yeah. any, you know, supplement. Yeah. But they, you know, which is arguably worse than cigarettes and, yeah. and alcohol and some, you know. Well, instances. I mean, I can remember back in college, like, you know, that GNC and, uh, you know, they had stuff there that, you don't even know. It looked marketed, looked cool, and they had some ripped guy, you know, with chains right. on his neck. But and it's, not, it's not And you took proof. it, and I remember a couple times, I can't remember what some of the stuff was, and it would, like, make my heart want to jump out of my chest. And I, like, took it a couple times during a workout, and I'm like, screw this. You know, I mean, for me, I've always led, like, the life of, like, organic as much as possible, you know, healthy, whole foods, that sort of a thing. I'd rather eat my nutrition rather than drink it, if you will, you know. Like, if I have to drink a protein shake because that's all I physically have around me, then I will. But I look at nutrition much more as a fuel source. Treat your body as a Ferrari, not like a Ford Pinto, right? You want to put in 93 octane in your body, not 87. Mm. So you want to think about nutrition, not diet. You want to think about adding value back into yourself, not subtracting value out. And that's where athletes come into play. Like, they look at things like, oh, crap, I just worked out. I need to have some healthy fats. I need to have, you know, a quick carb, you know, boost. And I need to have some protein for sure, you know, to help my muscles recover. And that's what I need. They don't sit there and say, oh, okay, I'm going to eat a bunch of crappy sugar, you know, that's going to burn off because I just burnt everything off. It doesn't speak to your body. Like, right. So that's why, like, athletes, I always tell people, treat your body like an athlete that you are rather than, like, you know, trying to subtract things out of your diet. And it's easier said than done. I mean, they always say diet and exercise is, mm -hmm. you know, it goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. When I work out, I'm always starving. Yeah. You know, and what, if before I... Before or after? After. Okay, yeah. You work out, you know, more hungry, you know, the rest of the day. Exactly. But and then it's like, I don't want to eat crap, but I'm but it's going not. to. But you have to be careful of what you eat. That's right. what I was saying. You so what do you, what, what diet do you go on? If you're, you work out, you're doing an intense cardio workout, let's mm -hmm. say, and, you know, maybe some weight training as well. Mm -hmm. What kind of diet is best suited for someone like that to be able to fulfill look, that hunger? Are you looking to add muscle or... Um, let's just but say for just fitness for, the, for just the average guy, like for, the for you, person. for you at your yeah, height. Yeah, well, use weight me as an example. Yeah. So for you, you're not, you don't need to lose any major weight or anything like that. For you, I would look at like a good healthy fat, like and I've, like you know a great thing for you post workout would be like half of an avocado, some grilled chicken, and then some sort of like green like vegetable with like several other vegetables thrown in. So something like spinach with like the, the you know a big handful of green grilled chicken and like half of an avocado, maybe a, a cut up, you know, a hard boiled egg on there. And then, you know, three to four different vegetables of different colors and textures, that sort of a thing. Cause then you're getting all your fibers, you get all your proteins, you're getting your healthy fat. And that's a great, you know, healthy, organic, you know, as organic as possible in this day and age, yeah. you know, but it's, a, but that's like a great post workout rather than just, you know, pounding down a shake or whatever. Now, if you're like, sometimes for me, like I'm in between, you know, between things, this, that, the other thing. So it's just like, I'll do like a Justin's nut butter packet. I love those. They're 180, 190 calories, low sugar. And it's just, you know, almond butter is the ones I prefer. And it's, it's just, it's something easy to take down. And it's like, 
out of a package. And it's probably one of the more healthy overall things that you can eat out of a package. Now, if you're looking to lose weight, you know, you probably want to like be careful with that, but you can actually have a decent amount of proteins. You just want to be careful with your sugars overall, you know? It's, it's, it, you can't sit there and burn 400 to 800 calories in your workout and then take down 1,000 calories or 1,200 calories and expect to lose that weight. But it's also on how you work out, too. You know, there's people that'll work out for an hour and I see them reading the Wall Street Journal on the treadmill. I'm like, they didn't work out. No. You know, they're sitting there wasting their time for an hour. Um, there's other people I could give like three minute workout to that did way more than that person on the treadmill that was reading something. So it's not really about time. It's no, about not at all. It's about the intensity. It's about the intensity and the quality that you're doing. Okay, and uh, a couple more questions on diet and exercise since I think it's important. It's something people don't you gotta really use pay nutrition. To. You can't use the word diet anymore. Uh, nutrition. You gotta take nutrition diet. Nutrition and exercise. So, <laughs> what's wrong with what's wrong with diet? Why? Because that implies you're gonna have a diet soda. Yeah. No. You, diet to me is just a. It's a bad four-letter world. Most four-letter words are, are negative, right? You know. F right. word, S word, whatever, right. you know? Rich so, is a bad, yeah. it's a bad thing well, rich today is, now. Well, rich is all right, right? Uh, well, no, I think so. Yeah. Not, not if you ask Bernie Sanders about it. Yeah, but. exactly. But so, so, you know, with that, you know, you want to think about nutrition because you're adding value back into yourself. You know, you want to take that athlete's mindset of saying, okay, I'm an athlete. Chris is an athlete. You know, everyone here is an athlete. My, you know, the 80-year-old people down the street are athletes, that sort of thing. So just because age, whatever, gender, it doesn't matter. Everyone's an athlete. As Bill Bowerman, the founder of Nike, said, one of the founders of Nike said, you know, if you have a body, you're an athlete. And it's probably one of the most poignant statements ever been said about fitness and nutrition, health, whatever you want to call it, is that, yes, you are. You know, it's about thinking about adding value into your system. Like I said, post-workout, eat healthy fats, eat some good amount of protein, that sort of a thing. Don't think about like subtracting out and being like, okay, I just worked out super, super hard. Now I can't eat anything. This sucks. I hate this. How consistent are you going to be with that? I hate that. It sounds boring, you know? And, and you need fuel. Yes, you need fuel. Exactly. That's the thing is like back to that, that statement I said earlier is that, you know, 93 octane, not 87. You know, 87 octane is simple sugars, things that just burn off in like two seconds, right? 93 octanes are gonna be the more fiber, more protein, more healthy fats that sustain you longer so that you're not eating crappy, processed, high sugar foods all the time. All right, real quick, protein bars, are they, are they good to go with? Chocolate protein say, bars or something you know, to that What extent? I said earlier, I think that less is more. Less ingredients technically usually are better. So sometimes protein bars, it, there could be a number of brands out there. Look at the package. If there's 20 ingredients and you can't pronounce 17 of those, is it gonna be healthy? Probably not, even if it says in the macronutrients that it's, you know, 30 grams of protein and, you know, whatever, you know, grams of fat and fiber and whatever. I don't know. To me, I'd rather, once again, eat like a simple, you know, a one or two simple packets of like an almond butter packet and then maybe a piece of fruit. Huh? Seriously, that's the, like a Clementine. Is that the best healthy snack? For, you know, for myself, I feel like that's good. But once again, I'm not looking to lose a ton of weight. For your average person, yeah, I think that they need to have a certain amount of healthy fat and protein in their diet no matter what, post-workout uh, and fiber, because fiber helps hold you over, rather than even if you're an obese person trying to lose weight. You know, you can't just sit there and cut everything out of your diet and then your, your, your body is gonna like go okay with that for a little while. But as you've seen with some of the results of like The Biggest Loser and stuff that you were mentioning earlier, that there's certain ways that people might lose stuff very quickly, but it's not gonna be sustainable because their metabolism and their hormones don't catch up to them at that point. They put they spent 10 to 20 years putting on weight and they spent three to six months taking weight off and then their body's in a flux and they're like, holy cow, what's gonna happen now? I, you know, So your body is very much a hormonally driven organism that you need to make sure you take care of. So if you've done damage for 10 or 20 years, it's gonna take a while to return it. So have a realistic view of your expectations. You know, if you weigh 300 pounds and you wanna lose 100 pounds, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna be a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. But the cool part about it, it's just like childbirth. You know, my wife's six months pregnant with our second child. You know, as a parent, to be for the second time myself, it's like, whoa, you know, you see the process of how much it takes and what your wife's going through as a man, you know, and, and uh, you know, and you, you know, talk about with my wife and you see what her body's going through as a female. And it's just like, whoa, there's a beauty to that process, right? And the same thing, there's a beauty to that process of losing weight. You're going to go through a hell of a lot of tough times. You know, you're going to go through that blood, sweat, and tears, and then some. You know how much better you're going to come out for it from that? You're never going to want to be that person that was over there before. You're going to, like, kick them to the curb. And that's like the 10 women on Strong. They're like, I can't wait to see what their ideal person looks like in the beginning of the show. That's what a lot of the women were saying. And it truly was 
being the best version of themselves. It wasn't like, I want to look like her on the magazine. It's like, no, no, no. I want to look like the best Giovanna, you know, ever at, you know, 39, badass Giovanna at 39, you know, having three kids and everything else that life throws at you. Well, what's that person going to look like? She's not going to look like Giovanna at 19. You know, you're not turning back the clock. You're trying to be the best version of yourself at this point in so time. So self-worth is important in working totally. out. You don't want to yeah. be like, for me, you know, people always say, well, who do you, uh, you know, emulate? And for me, it's like, I just want to be myself. You yeah. know, I don't want to be someone who I'm not yeah. uh, in business or whatever. Mm -hmm. So is that something that with exercise, it's like you got to have your own self-worth and you have to kind of know when you're, be strong in mind yeah. when you work out that I don't want to look like, Kourtney Kardashian, I want to be myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You First know? thing I can do. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it, it's totally that way. It's just like myself, you know, at, at some point, I had to realize I wasn't going to be an NCAA champion. I wasn't going to be an Olympian. I was damn close, but, uh, you know, it was what it was. There's, you know, a lot of other people out there just 0 0.01 seconds better than me. And it's hard, you know, it's like the stopwatch doesn't lie in track and field. And it's a very unforgiving sport, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that being an athlete at a high level, it teaches you how to help teach the rest of the world. That's the other 99% of the people out there of just being like, Neil, look, you're not going to be seven foot tall. You're not playing center for the next 70 time in this lifetime. Right. But that's cool. You're, you're, you're owning up to it, man. And you're like, look, I, I train and I have my weight set in my, in my basement. I do my cardio when I can in between work and everything else and all the other obligations you have going on. You're just like, I just want to be badass Neil. And you should be, you know? And I'm, you know, having my second kid here with my wife shortly and time is of the, you know, the essence and there's very little time that I have, free time to work on myself. And it's just like, okay, what can Chris do to be where he's at, you know? Thankfully, I've invested in myself physically in a lot of ways so that I'm able to more of a maintenance mode but not everyone's gonna be me, you know? Um, I was a division one athlete for a reason. I, I worked my butt off physically at that time in my life, you know? And thankfully I stayed in shape afterward too. But it was always a passion for me, you know? But one thing that's been the same is I've always been consistent with it. So even if you've fallen off the wagon in your 20s or your 30s or if you're 70, it doesn't matter, you know? My mom's remarried now and her husband it was never really into fitness. But now he, you know, he's getting into it in his like late, when he was in his late 60s and now he's in his early 70s. And it's great to see that he's able to do that stuff. And he's not, you know, looking to be some world-class, you know, master's level athlete. He's just looking to be, you know, the best version of himself at, you know, 71, 72 years old. And it's about, you know, back to the mobility, back to, you know, the, the balance just control basics. and stuff. Yeah, right. it's about being able to go for a hike when they're traveling around and not being having to worry about going up a flight of stairs. All right, so we prolonged this long enough. <laughs> You're going to train me. Chris is going to train me here at Velocity Sports yes. Performance, which, by the way, is a beautiful gym yeah, it's in awesome Midtown. Gym. Um, all right, tell me what kind of workout you're going to uh, provide to me today. Well, first of all, I'm going to look at where we're at with you. I'm going to have you go through some basic movement control as far as like see where your squat's at. I want to make sure your body moves correctly, you know. Um, and then we're going to do some stuff without your shoes for a little bit because I want to see the way your feet move and I want you to understand your body from the inside out. I want you to see how your body moves a little bit more. Then we're gonna pull out these uh, bad boy sleds out here because I know you don't have those in your basement. <laughs> no, I do you not. Know, I, I know you have some good stuff in your basement <laughs> from what it sounds like, but I want, I want you to learn something that you might never have done before. Okay. And you know, moving weight at a high intensity, heavy weights, light weights, and I'm gonna show you the difference between moving heavy weights at a low intensity, but you're still putting a lot of force and generation in, and it's still very hard, versus moving a very lightweight with no weight on the sled and just doing runs back and forth. I want you to understand how you're breathing, like, you know, how your core is engaged, how your feet are engaged, different sorts of, you know, muscles being worked, that sort of thing. Because I, I truly believe that you can show a man how to fish or you can give a man a fish. What's better? You know, you're going to feed, I'm going to feed you for a lifetime and the, the little So you're knowledge, Jesus, so you're basically. Gonna, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Walk on water, right? Yeah. That's after we're going to the uh, reservoir in a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Chris Ryan is going to show me what, uh, how to work out. See how I do. I got my uh, Marines shirt on for some inspiration. All right, we we'll go. see how it goes. Chris, <laughs> thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah.